blowout, eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits on a three on the He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome to this weekend bonus episode with John Smoltz again, who joins me weekly here on Flippin' Bats. And this one's going to be cool because earlier this week, I spoke pretty highly about this current Atlanta Braves team and how I believe this is the best Braves team since at least the early 2000s. So I'm going to ask John about that and see what he thinks. And um, I mean, I'm excited to talk to him about that. And, and I'm sure he'll talk about his teams as well. Also, Roki Sasaki coming up to talk about as well. Pitcher in Japan just had a big NPB matchup against Yamamoto. And John Smoltz actually got to see him live and in person during the World Baseball Classic. And I'm excited to talk to him about what he thinks about the young phenom in Roki Sasaki. And lastly, what I need to ask John Smoltz is a question that I ask pretty much every guest I have on this show, which is, what was your welcome to the big leagues moment? And I know John Smoltz is going to have a great one. So without further ado, let's get to it on this bonus edition of Flippin' Bats and welcome in Hall of Fame pitcher for the Atlanta Braves, John Smoltz. All right, and I am pumped to bring on now John Smoltz as we do typically weekly. John, thank you for joining me, my friend. Uh, it's good to be on again. Big, uh, big golf tournament for you this week. Is that what I hear? Yeah, invited Celebrity Classic here in Dallas, Las Colinas Country Club. So uh, this is the calm before the storm. This is why I got my hip replaced to try to see if I can compete again. And then every Saturday after this Saturday, I'll have a game on Fox and I'll be blocked into baseball. So this is uh, <laughs> this is my last week of, uh, <laughs> I guess, competitive juices that I uh, will will have for until July. I love that. So, John, this week I want to start with. Uh, your former organization. And something I said earlier this week is that I believe this current Braves team is the best Braves team that we have seen since the early 2000s. Better than that 2021 team that won the World Series. Now, that's not to say this team is going to win the World Series. It's obviously baseball. But a healthy Ronald Acuna, Sean Murphy behind the plate, Spencer Strider, the addition there in the rotation. What are your thoughts upon hearing me say something like that no i agree uh the, you know when i when i look at the the history of the organization all the way back to when i started the one thing that we were not known for is a tremendous offense okay so we are always known for our pitching and defense and that kept us in every year that's why we won uh we also stayed healthy i think there was a 10-year spurt where the big three didn't miss a start i was the first one to miss a start but this team is equipped to do anything they want offensively they're gifted speed is through the roof and their pitching staff is more than adequate. And I think the, the fact that if they have health in their rotation, they have decent depth, which is important today, I think it could be the best baseball team the Atlanta Braves have trotted out in a long time, if ever. And I know that goes all the way back to Hank Aaron, but I can't think of a better offensive squad than they've got really from the top to the bottom. And I know the games play differently, and there, there's guys that do the lineup that can hit home runs. But when you can keep Max Freed healthy, and you can have Strider, like you said, healthy, and then you sprinkle in a veteran like Morton. If they can get Kyle Wright back to where he was last year and his shoulder is not an issue, they have the front three that can match with anybody. And this is going to be a two-headed, maybe three-headed race in the in the East with the Mets being so good and the Phillies kind of banged up. So I would I would not argue your statement at all, having lived it through my career knowing what our success and our formula was is so much different than the formula they have now. They're way more balanced than we ever were. And that's a good thing for a team that has a chance to uh, win another championship. I want to ask you about Spencer <clears throat> Strider real quick. Cause I, I picked Strider to win the NL Cy Young award this year. That's how talented I think he is. Obviously health comes into play there. Longevity He's never pitched a full season in the big league. So there's a lot that goes into it there, but when it comes to Spencer Strider, so far in his young career, what have you seen from him and what have you liked about what you see from him? Well, the one thing with an, av an everyday, you know, the average velocity being the way it is, and he's way above average, he knows his body. He sinks into his legs. He's very in tune with his, his mechanics. And I think that is a huge thing that not a lot of pitchers 
have the luxury of knowing. I mean, they're taught and built to throw a ball through a brick wall, and I get it. But I don't think everybody understands the mechanical um, nuances that go along with pitching in a long season. So when you throw this hard, but you're not really grunting, uh, you're getting down through your lower half, and it's the base of which is going to make your your top half, your right shoulder, uh, take. It's kind of like, um, it's like your lower half is the foundation of a great building, and as taller the building goes, it's more sturdy because the foundation's good. And I think that's his key. So minus that. He's the sky's the limit. And I love the way that he can throw a fastball in the zone with great backspin and they just don't see it. Now, can he pitch like that the whole career, like a Nolan Ryan? Who knows? He might be a freakish lower half <clears throat> physique that allows him to do that. If he can hit with his other pitches, that changeup's coming along, but that slider turns the corner, I agree with you. He's going to be a front runner. And now that he went through last year, had a little hiccup with an injury, had that postseason game go the way he did, I think it benefits him in the long run, if he can learn from that, and next time he's in that situation, obviously have a different result. For this next pitcher <clears throat> I want to talk about, we need to go to Japan for this. But you saw him recently, and there was a big matchup in the MPB recently, Roki Sasaki against Yamamoto. Sasaki being the young phenom, uh, you got to see him up close in the World Baseball Classic, and I would highly imagine that was your first time ever watching him pitch in person. When you see and watch Roki Sasaki pitch, what do you think? Oh, man, I, what an electric arm. Uh, smooth, athletic, young, fastball that pops out of his hand, split that has gears. When you could throw a split finger like he does, he didn't even showcase his other pitches. That's, what, that's how impressive he was. And the sky's the limit for this young man because of his age and when he decides, I guess they're going to post him. And if not already, it, you know, maybe three years from now, he gets in the big leagues. I think that, you know, we're seeing an evolution of pitching in Japan that has never been, you might sprinkle in a guy here or there, you know, started with Nomo. And of course, you know, you have had guys before him, but all of a sudden we're starting to see the arms in Japan match the arms in the United States. And that is something that is uh, electric and they have a different pitching philosophy over there. They go about it a different way, you know, not so much the strong survive but they throw and pitch a lot more often than we do here in the states so they have a different philosophy that they've gotten used to and their ability to pitch and throw the ball to where they want to is pretty unmatched and look they may not come out at six five throwing a hundred but this young man along with otani are going to set the, the the stage for the future arms that that we're seeing in japan it never used to be this way and now it is and they're just as capable of dominating the, the major league baseball does he remind you of anybody you've seen either playing now or when you were playing or even before? Does he remind you of anybody? I was talking to Rowdy Telez about him recently because he faced him in that game, and he said he's throwing 102, but it's moving all over the place, and his splitter's like 92 miles an hour, and it's nasty. So ha does he remind you of anyone? You know, it's pretty unique. Normally that'll, that'll just pop out watching a pitcher. Um <clears throat> His split finger is better than anybody I've seen. I, I mean, Otani's got a great one. Uh, he's kind of like an Otani, not a clone, but but he has that makeup of just – Otani looks like everything he does is easy, right? That's how great he is, right? When he swings a bat, looks easy, 520 feet. No one else can do that. When he throws a baseball, looks easy. So I, I would say, you know, somewhere between DeGrom and, and – uh, Otani, I mean, this is this young man really caught my eye when I saw the way the ball came out of his hand. And at the young age that he's in, they even said, talking to the Japan manager, he's ahead of Otani. So think about that. That's all you need to know. So what's his ceiling? If you if you had to think of what's his ceiling when he comes over to Major League Baseball, what would it be? You know, he's um, he's still a few years away from being able to be posted and coming over. So when he does come over. Do you have a ceiling for him? I think from a pitching standpoint, it'd be the highest bidding we've ever seen. Um, it won't, he is not a two-way player. So it's unfair to say Otani and, and what his post was. I don't know exactly how the, how, how, how it all works with the posting, but I know that team's <laughs> going to get a lot of money and uh, you know, and, and I think he has the capability when you look at what major league baseball, I don't know how the trends can continue. We've been saying this for a long time. The pitching salaries have gone to a place where, I don't know if it, 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 I don't know if it can go much higher for pure pitching, not Otani. That's going to be separate. But 
when you talk about pitching in the today's game and if they start valuing stuff with staying healthy, then the ceiling's off the roof. Yeah. But if we're still going to keep paying for stuff without the process of being healthy, then <laughs> it's a good it's a good time to be a pitcher. Let's put it that way, because the ability to throw the kind of stuff that we've seen in the game is unmatched. I, I, I would argue we've never seen this kind of stuff on a um, broad range from the ability these pitchers have. But the one thing you've heard me echo over and over and over again is the injury rates are still through the roof. So there's a point in overturn at some point, you know, the value of knowing a pitcher can pitch 10 to 15 years, which should be the mark is starting to become less and less. And I hope that trend changes. I hope we find a way to combine the great athleticism and the health that comes along with it. John, you're, you're trying to trick everybody. You're saying your hip replacement is to get back on the golf course it's actually to make a comeback and to make that money that's out there <laughs> oh. for pitchers now <laughs> you know what uh i i i beat my body up and part of staying healthy <laughs> was i pitched a lot of games yep. when you know you don't feel good it was a different era and i'm not i don't regret i think it's awesome for these pitchers that what they're getting because they're talented beyond belief but in our era it was you got paid to play and you know so a lot of us pitch through some things that um you know we're paying uh we're paying that result right now and that's fine that was i would never trade anything i got one more hip to do and i think i'm done i think the two hips three soldiers three shoulders and and four elbows should be Ooh. about that that should be good <laughs> i'll be ready to go that should take you on in for your your golf career i i agree with you uh last one for you john this is a question i every guest i have on i like to ask this and i get some funny stories from it and I don't think I've ever asked you this question. So in your career, obviously, Hall of Fame baseball player, we know how the career turned out. But did you have like a welcome to the big leagues moment that happened to you in your career when you got up there? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I was super excited. I won my first game. It's in uh, Shea Stadium. Um, we end up we end up coming to San Diego and on my chair in San Diego was a note that uh, Mr. Bear would love to interview you and it's the number and this is when they had telephones in the locker room you had to go through the operator so I'm in front of everybody I get on the phone I get to the operator and I give her the number and I said Mr. Bear is is um, you know wanting it you know this is I, that's all I had to name was yeah. Mr. Bear and uh, within 30 seconds I noticed everybody was watching me like I was on camera and I hear the message, welcome to the San Diego Zoo. And I started laughing because they had set me up that Mr. Bear was not a real person. It was the San Diego <laughs> Zoo that I was calling. And so I uh, put the phone down and that was my welcome to the big leagues, kid. Uh, now go humble yourself and sit back in your locker. But yeah, I'll never forget that. I was so excited. I would have done any interview there was, you know, here I was just getting called up and and I was so excited on that phone, and I heard, uh, "Hello, this is the San Diego Zoo. Can we help you?" <laughs> so that was I after said, your I've first got the wrong win. Number. Yeah, yeah. Was your first yeah, win so was, and your first start? My first win was in my first start at Shea Stadium on Tom Seaver Day. Um, you know, this the beginning of my career was was pretty pretty incredible on a team that wasn't going anywhere. Uh, I win my first start. Um, I go eight innings. I give up one run. And, then my next start, I go nine innings in Cincinnati, against Cincinnati, tie game in the ninth, and I give up a three-run homer. And then we go to the West Coast, and then that's when the interview uh, <laughs> request uh, came about. And ironically, after that, I didn't get out of the third inning for three straight starts. So <laughs> oh, no. I went from the most euphoric feeling you can have in winning my first start on Tom Seaver Day in front of 45,000 fans and the team that went on to go to the pennant, you know, the Mets, and then I lose a heartbreaking in the ninth. And then I'm like, okay, you know, that's all right. You know, 17 innings here in the first two starts. And then I don't get, I don't get out of the third inning. And I ended up two and seven and went back to my lab at home, if you will. We didn't have a lab then. If it was today's time, it would be a lab yeah. and reconstructing everything. But I, it, it really set the table for what I needed to do to get better. And that's the one thing that I am so thankful for in my era that we got a chance to get our brain speed in. We got a chance to absolutely learn on the job mm -hmm. so that it made us better instead of being shipped to the bullpen or back to the minors, you know. And I think that is such a big missing component because it is now what you need to be. You got to be on your game and right away, if not, next man up.
and it served us well. And I say all the time, and Glavin and Maddox will say the same thing, if it weren't for that, I don't think we'd become on our journey to what ended up being in the Hall of Fame because we learned through failure, and that was, uh, that was pretty awesome. Is there anyone out there, John, that if I asked them their welcome to the big leagues moment, that it would involve you? Did you were you involved in anyone's welcome to the big leagues moment on the other side of things? No, I don't believe so. Um, <laughs> you know, luckily we didn't have that ball club that was going to make it miserable for the young yeah. man. Uh, we had, uh, honestly, it. I, I heard stories all over the all over the league about how this is a true story. When a, when a veteran and a guy in my era, like when, when I played with those guys and they would come over and I would see how bitter they were, my question to them was, who ruined it for you? And they popped out a name right away because that veteran back then would make it so difficult on the rookie to kind of, you know, full circle, like this is what happened to them. And, and I would say, who ruined it for you? And they would make the name. And then when I'd see somebody handle it the, the other way, I'd say, who paid it for you like who who did this for you yeah. and they would have that name so it's one of two avenues <laughs> um luckily for me i say it all the time alan trammell was the most class guy i've ever met in my life when i got signed by the tigers i went into the big leagues for 30 days because i missed rookie ball and he in essence passed the baton on to me without saying it and if i ever got in a situation to do that for a young player that's how I viewed my tenure in Atlanta, whether it was Brian McCann, Jeff Francoeur, every young player that got called up, I would go to him and say, I'm here for you. This is what, you know, I was never sure there were some fun things. They would get dressed up and all that, but I was never part of that as a, um, the leader of that. I wanted to welcome them and make them, make them experience what I got to experience. And that was a lot more fun for me than necessarily uh, even though the Mr. Bear was funny and it was great, um, I, I would rather put my arm around a guy and welcome him to the big leagues. It's it's great hearing you say that because uh, I, I played in the Tigers organization for five years, and I promise you, Tram hasn't changed one bit. No. From the second I got in that organization, anything uh, defensively, offensively at the plate, if I'm struggling, if I'm going well, he'd come up, he'd put his arm around me and he'd share some of yeah. his past experiences. And I will forever hold that near and dear to my heart. So, uh, yeah, it means a little, it, it's funny. It creates a funny story when it's the other way, but it creates like lifetime memories when you have a guy that puts his arm around you and shares his experiences with you. There's, there's no doubt. And you know, that might be missing in today's game. It's a young game. I get it. And there's some d dynamic young players with maybe the minus some veteran presence. Um, but I, I, I promise you when you can make a difference and you can impact players, it's lifelong, it's friend long, you, your friends forever. And, uh, those are the ones that I remember. I, I had laugh a lot. I, you know, me, I like dumb and dumber is my favorite movie. So I'd rather <laughs> whatever prank I did was going to be a good prank that didn't cause tremendous shame or harm uh and so that's how that's how i live by it uh john i appreciate you as always for joining me hey good luck today on the golf course uh big things for you hopefully this weekend and when you run into inevitably at some point my friend marty fish you got to give him crap for me all right i sure will all right john thank you yep you got it See ya. All right, just wanted to thank again John Smoltz for joining me. Always a blast of a conversation and very cool to hear him talk about those Braves teams that he was a part of and compare this current Braves team and say it was more all around. It was a more all around team than even his teams and arguably the best team since Hank Aaron's Atlanta Brave teams. Pretty cool to hear him say that as well as his welcome to the big leagues moment. I mean, Calling a zoo. I mean, just great stories. You know John Smoltz has them, and he mentioned some of the pranks he pulled throughout his years. John Smoltz comes on pretty much weekly on Flipping Bats, which is very cool for me to be able to say. And a question I'm certainly going to have to ask in the future are some of the best pranks that he ever pulled on people throughout his career. So thank you all for listening to this bonus Saturday edition of Flipping Bats. I appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe anywhere you listen to your podcast, Apple or Spotify, wherever. We're also on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And you can watch every single episode as well on YouTube at Flippin' Bats Pod for all of them. Well, I hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend. For this episode of Flippin' Bats, that is it. And until next time, I will see you later.